I grew up in um, Carolina, Arizona, with that frustration towards the state of Arizona. And like you, I never learned about any of this in school. <coughs> uh, there's a lot I haven't figured out over the last years that I did not learn in school. Um, so first, I have to say this book, Revolution in Our Time, which went 2021. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, it came out 2021. Is a National Book Award finalist. A Coretta Scott King author honor awardee from the Bubble Los Angeles Times Book Prize for a Young Adult Literature finalist and a Michael Allen Pence Award honoree. And there's a lot more that could be said. Congratulations, first and foremost. Thank you. struggling to get it published and hoping that it would turn out, right? And I mean, I actually sold it to a publisher and received feedback that was clearly um, quite um, uncomfortable, that the editorial team was quite uncomfortable with the material. And I knew that I couldn't do the book I wanted to do in that place, so I had to, um, you know, should try again. Um, you know, what I'm finding overall over Last 10 years, not just with this book, but with the novels as well, is that people would come um, with the novels and say, Well, this can't be, this can't be true. Like, this is fiction, right? You've made this up. This isn't really what the Panthers were doing. I say, Oh, no, this is based in, in reality. Um, and so being able to point to the nonfiction has been actually really helpful because people find it really um, surprising and shocking. And, you know, many people who live through, through this era even don't know the history the way that. The Panthers taught it in a way that they really experienced it. So um, the, I'm very fortunate that the reception has been extremely warm, even in this context of, um, of book challenges and whatnot. Um, it's been, for the most part, teachers are so excited to actually have it's the first nonfiction book about the Black Panthers for this age group that's accessible um, and is accessible to adults as well. You know, it just doesn't read like the academic tomes that you find in <laughs> somebody's dissertation <laughs> on the Panthers. Um, so I think people are enjoying the photos, there's over um, almost 200 photos in the book, archival photos um, from all over the country, um, just to illustrate the different moments in history and trying to bring it to life, it's just combat that snapshot. Um, so I think that, that ultimately that effort is kind of successful. <laughs> um, you know what, I've been really excited to hear that you've been traveling into some of the schools talking with students about this book, talking with the young people about the book. And you know, you shared a quote with us a, a few minutes ago, but the epigraph to your book is that quote in the line from Huey Newton that reads, the revolution has always been in the hands of the young, mm -hmm. and you have written this to put it into the hands of the young. Yeah. But why did you actually open the book with that specific quote? One of the most surprising things I learned about the civil rights movement as an adult as I started this research was that the engine of the civil rights movement was young people, was teenagers, was middle school students, high school students, college students, young 20s, right? And, um, it wasn't Rosa Parks' lover, who's amazing, right? Rosa Parks and the people her age were partners in the movement, but they chose Rosa Parks specifically because she had this adult, respectable look and feel to her. There was another young woman, Claudette Colvin, who had done something very similar in a way that wasn't planned, the way that Rosa Parks' protest was planned. Um, you know, Claudette Colvin spontaneously did not give up her seat on the bus and was arrested. Um, and they did not choose to make her the model, right? They chose to make Rosa Parks the model because there's a way that we sort of want to package and present, right, the movement and when we tell the history. It's always Dr. King, who, by the way, was considered a young upstart in his day, right? He wasn't this, you know, respectable old man, right? He was 39 when he was killed. The majority of his ministry took place in his 20s and 30s. He was considered young and revolutionary, too. Um, and so the fact that the teen college protests were kind of missing from the narrative that I learned growing up, I found really distressing, and I think that that's part of the deliberate 
uh, reframing of the movement to conceal from kids how much power they actually have even in our own world today. If you understand that 13 year olds are the ones that made that happen, well, oh, I'm 13, what can I do, right? I think it opens up that possibility. And so I wanted any kid who picks up that book to kind of just get that little spark of like, oh, the revolution's in my hands. It's in my friend's hands. What does that mean? That's intriguing. You know, the other thing that you do in your book, you have um, these really um, welcoming section headings. So it's spark and kindling and blaze and embers. And how does that imagery of fire, how does that thread through the rest of the book? I have, yeah, I have so many different metaphors that I explain with when I was working on this. Um, and fire is, you know, something that feels very true to me, this, like, just the kind of passion and the kind of anger and the kind of um, the, the, the desperation and the need for change um, that's part of the movement. Um, and so I, I like the idea that it's something that, um, you know, yeah, there's that weak spark ingrown into a whole fire, right? Let's really start a fire with one little map, which are right rubbing, I mean, I can't start one by rubbing sticks together, but allegedly, right? People can do that. Um, and so, but like a one match fire, right? Like you stack up the twigs, it's just the right way, and you get that spark, and you have this blaze. I really think that, you know, just like the raindrops, right? It's a different metaphor for how something small can grow if it's fed, something small can grow if it joins with other things like it, right? Um, and so that, it, it spoke to me as a metaphor, um, yeah, just that sense of, oh, we need a blaze, we need a fire, we need something to grab people's attention and, you know, really transform, you know, because fire also transforms the thing that, you know, it's not like making us out, where everything is still, you know, its own thing, there's carrots in there, and celebrating other things, it's like, no, you're taking this wood and you're transforming it into charcoal, right, it's becoming a different thing, and that's what we want from a revolution, we want to really transform our culture so that we have something for version. Um, so in doing the research for this book, tell us about one or two characters you were really excited about. And what is it about their stories that you really wanted to share? Hmm. Um, okay, so um, one of the so one of the characters of the book is um, <laughs> it's also a research character, so there's a guy named uh, Billy X. Jennings, who lives in Sacramento now. He's a, um, a former Panther, and he's kind of the archivist of the party. Um, and so he's, he has a, he's turned his home into kind of a museum of Panther artifacts, um, and he's, you know, he knows everybody, and you know, a lot of the photos in the book are from um, his, his organization. Um, and so he, you know, he's somebody who's like, I was so scared to call him, because I was like, okay, I have to talk to him, but I know that you know, he's gonna, you know, he did, he's just saying, okay, so who do you know, and what, you know, what do you know, are you a fed, like, you know, <laughs> he's got all these questions for me. Um, and so, like, just as a character, you know, like, he was so, um, so warm and so helpful and so lovely, and he just has this great personality, and he's a, I mean, he's a librarian, he's not trained as a librarian, but he's, he has that personality where he just, he has every issue of the Black Panther newspaper that you, that's ever published, and, um, he keeps track of everything, um, and just the, you know, he was a rank and file member. He wasn't particularly famous in the party, but he's just somebody who really um, feels deeply for the history and kept it. Um, and so, sort of meeting and talking with him um, was particularly special. But in terms of like people whose narrative in the story I, um, from the Pan life of the Panthers, um, Erba Huggins is somebody who inspires me a lot. She um, was. Uh, she, so she and her husband, John Huggins, came from uh, Pennsylvania in early in the party to Los Angeles, and they became leaders in the Los Angeles chapter. Um, she, so they were leaders in the Los Angeles chapter. Her husband was killed um, in, by, this essentially probably by an affair, but like by a sort of rival um, group members. Um, and uh, when he was assassinated, she returned to the East Coast where she became the head of the New England chapter. Um, and she was in prison for a time, um, for about a year, a little over a year. Um, and you 
that went to trial and had all kinds of um, just like really powerful experiences like across the party. Like you could tell the history of the Black Panther Party just by following Erica Huggins' narrative um, because she did it all. She was a chapter leader, she was on both coasts, she was in prison and a political prisoner for a time. She um, founded the Oakland Community School and was the leader of the Oakland Community School for a long time and is an educator still today. Um, and I got to meet her in Oakland when I went there for the 50th anniversary celebration. Um, that she was, you know, one of the people who you think, oh my gosh, you know, you live through this harrowing history, you were an incredibly powerful leader, and maybe you still have time to have coffee with this little writer who you don't know me from a hole in the wall, but you know, the woman I did the school visit with have set me up for coffee, and Eric Ogden just met me for coffee, and it was so um, uh, empowering that somebody like that would take time to, to chat with me. Um, and so her story is, is woven through revolution in our time. Um, I think that points to something that uh, many readers have, have taken away from the book. That one, we often aren't told this history, right? It, it's kind of it's erased, it's, it's not something that we learn. But when we do learn bits of history, we often don't learn the history of women yeah. in these movements. Tell us what it was like and, and what your purpose is in kind of weaving her story and of bringing the women to the forefront in this book. Yeah. Um, so just the sheer fact that at the peak of the Panthers membership, about 65% of the members were women is amazing, right? That's a huge fact that I didn't know. And so like Erica Huggins, when I met with her, and I'm saying, you know, I, this was early in the research process, and I said something like, yeah, I'm like, I see this really important to me to highlight women's role in the party. And she kind of grabbed my arm, and she's like, not women's role in the party. No one would ever say men's role in the party. She was like, women were the party. And I was like, I mean, it was like, she had like the activist, like, black people with her eyes on you, and you're just like, yes, yes, I will never make this mistake again, ever, right? Like, it was, but it was a really powerful lesson to me that, like, you know, we do tend to kind of minimize women's role in things, right? We talk about it that way. Um, and so that, just that conversation with other pieces of the story, um, made me want to do the best I could to bring um, the various women who were powerful leaders within the movement to the front of my narrative. One of the challenges of that is just that the way a broader historical record tells the story is that you really have to pull those narratives out. Um, when, the, when the organization was founded, and I think I and Bobby Seale were going around finding young black men, like the mission, their mission when they set out was to gather young black men, um, and it was a young woman named Tarika Lewis, in Oakland who like came knocking on them, you know, knocking on their door and were like, hey, what is this thing about black men? Like I can do it. Like give me a leather jacket, like I'll go, you know, patrol the neighborhood, like I'll direct traffic at the intersection, right? Which is what they were doing initially. And um, and they were like, oh, okay. And so yeah, sure, there's no reason why you can't, you know? <laughs> and so they ended up being very egalitarian in their thinking around um, you know, gender roles within the, the party, women did everything, men did everything. Um, that's not to say that individual members didn't reflect some of the gender bias that you know, we are all steeped in our society. Um, so there's stuff um, there, but for the most part, it was an extremely women-forward organization, and so I wanted to reflect that as well as I could. You know, you have um, a fair number of photos in the, in the book. Tell us about the process you went through to choose which photos you wanted to have in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's about, I think there's something like 180 photos in the book. My goal was that there be some item of visual interest on every page spread. So that there aren't, you know, you open the book to any given page and you're gonna see at least one image or maybe a sidebar or something colorful. Um, and so with every chapter, um, I sent in a selection of photos that could illustrate that chapter and the book designer helped choose which ones were gonna go. Um, there were a few that I was like, this photo must be somewhere in the book, you know? But for the most part, I let him decide what would illustrate things best and what the pacing would be. Um, but I submitted, so probably I submitted, you know, maybe a third more photos than he actually needed, does that make sense? Um, so if I submitted 
15 photos, he might have used 10 in a given chapter. And sometimes we would swap stuff out. But once he did the whole layout, we had to go and see if we could get permissions for all of those images. So some images changed because of that. There were a few photos that I really wanted that were just too expensive. <laughs> um, and you know, it was it was a whole process of you know how much am I willing to spend, how much is the publisher willing to spend, <laughs> um, and and you know who who can I even contact the people to get the rights for the photos. Um, but the process was it was mostly you know, trying to put women front and center as much as possible, trying to illustrate different aspects of the party, and trying to combat this image of black men with guns. Um, like, I, I really didn't want there to be a gun on the cover. There's, like, only, like, the little corner of one. Like, I didn't want that image, black men with guns, to be the dominant image. So I thought, you know, if, if across the book overall, there are enough images to balance it out, then it'll help change people's perception of the party. And so, you know, this, it sounds like, and I, this is just me imagining, that you've been doing this research for years. <laughs> Tell us about when you started the research. Um, what were kind of the obstacles that you ran into, challenges doing the research? You know, we've heard a little bit about finding the right publisher, and somebody who, a publishing company that would really want to do this the way you needed to do it. But what were also the real, like, just, surprising and powerful takeaways that you came out with doing this research? Mm -hmm. I mean, the initial challenge was there was not very much online available at the beginning of the process. There's so much more available online about the Panthers now than there was when I started the research. So I literally was going to archives and sitting with the little white gloves and spending a lot of time in the Library of Congress and the Oakland Museums. Um, and the just the the experience of going through the archives really brought home the, the humanness of it all. You know, just, you know, everything feels so distant when you read about the past, right? You read it in a history book or even a, an academic textbook and it's all kind of intellectualized. Um, but then you're sitting there and it's like, oh no, here's the funeral program for Bobby Hutton, you know, or here's a button that somebody wore at a protest march, right? Here, um, here are the, the little flyers that were up in the community and you can see that somebody is like, you know, torn off a corner or there's like a stain on one. And I don't know, it just, it, you could feel the, you know, that little teenager who went and like put the push pin in that paper on a bulletin board somewhere and it made it feel um, more accessible um, than it ever felt to me in books. You feel like this research has been something that you're going to continue to move forward with and do more publications in? Definitely. I mean, I, I love research. I love going into the archives. I love finding out new information. But there's still more to learn about the Panthers, you know? Um, and more is revealed to me as, you know, I meet other people and hear other stories. Um, one of the most interesting processes, really, is just meeting people at events like this, where you know somebody will come up to me afterwards and be like, I moved across the street from one of the Black Panther houses, and here's a random story about the time I interacted with a panther, and it's always fascinating, right? So it's just this like, tapestry, right, of, of human experiences and stories. And so, yeah, the research never ends because of that. Um, and I, was, I, you know, I want to write a picture book, you know, to bring the history to even younger kids. Um, but that's, that's just as hard to find a way into and just as hard to find a way to publish. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, it's very true. Um, so, you know, what do you think is the legacy of the Black Panther Woman? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, certainly there's still um, members that are active doing the community organizing work. And I think the style of community organizing, organizing that they do actually has taken root in Black communities and has led to many other organizations. So I think their legacy is not. Um, not as clear, it's like more of like a web or like a network, kind of like underneath, right? The black communities where they were active. Um, and I think that their legacy is black, black history education, and hope we can preserve that as a, as a nation. Um, that, you know, we now learn the history in school that they were trying to teach in the community. Um, and hopefully we can continue to build that. And um, hopefully, you know, you know, again, you know, the young inherit the revolution, like that young people will um, go forward and that, you know, movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and young know, people who are involved in that and like the next, whatever comes next after that, um, that they will look back at this and see it as a stepping stone. Um, and so that the legacy, the legacy is expansive, right? The legacy is 
what comes next. The legacy is we keep fighting. So, uh, you know, Kekla, I have to say, as somebody who is trying to really um, encourage people to think about humanities, right? You have just embodied everything of humanities that we do. She's in archives. She's looking at yeah. materials and doing research and pulling out photos and talking to people, getting some oral history, doing interviews. You are the epitome. You can be with humanities for us. Um, <laughs> takeaway from the conversation. What do you hope readers take away um, from reading this book, but also what do you hope that we take away after this conversation tonight? Mm -hmm. um, so I hope, I hope readers take away a deeper understanding of the history and how it connects to the present day. I hope that they um, feel a sense of inspiration to, to use their particular voice or their particular skills to make a difference um, on an issue that feels important to them. If it's social justice, like me, great, but there's lots of other issues to advocate for, right? So my hope is that people will see, you know, look at all of these different panthers that did all of this work, right? This is not a biography of one person, it's a biography of a movement, right? Um, but that movement was made up of individuals who did small things, right, or big things, or a series of things, right, that made this change. And so I hope that people leave the book feeling like, oh, I could be part of something like that. I could be someone who makes a difference and having a little bit of a sense of what that might be. Um, and I hope the same for the people who are here. I thank you for coming to listen um, and think about these issues. But like, yeah, what do you do to take it forward? You know, that sort of challenge um, that I tried to offer when I was speaking and just, you know, like what are the things that you can do? What are the little things that you do to take it forward? Like well, who do you tell about what you experienced tonight? What was your takeaway? And how do you share that? How do you go out of the world um, and say, I'm gonna do something to make the world a better place on this issue, right? That I'm passionate about. That's what I hope people, people do. Well, I don't have any other questions, and we want to give the audience a little bit of time to ask questions as well. So, uh, we have one hand here. Are we taking one, one please. Oh, away? Thanks so much for coming. She is a classic humanist, absolutely, um, investigating the human story. I know that they did some really interesting intersectional work with Asian communities and Latinx communities, and I wondered, we're, we're multicolored, multicultural, multi-generational here. Are there any successes they had in doing that bridge building that you think would help us here? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so the Panthers were very active across um, racial and, and cultural and um, various lines, like they had, um, there's these sort of fascinating photos of um, Black Panther members in Chicago who are, you know, they have like a standard black leather jacket or whatever, working with young patriots who were white working class, white working class group who had like Confederate flags, right, on their jackets. And so like, they're like working together because it was an economic struggle, right? And they worked with the Young Lords, who was a Puerto Rican organizing group. They worked with the American Indian Movement. They worked with um, the uh, Red Guard. Like there was a lot of, um, different organizations who were all advocating for needs within their own community, their own ethnic group, or their own um, neighborhoods. Um, like in Chicago, Fred Hampton, who I, who I am a revolutionary guy, um, was exceptionally skilled at uh, bringing together um, those various street organizations that were working in different communities that had been rivals all these years. He talked to them, like conversation was the key. Right? Getting people to talk to each other about the things they have in common, not just the things that are causing conflict between them. Um, and so he brought all those different groups together because they had common struggles. And they stopped talking about black people, they started talking about all oppressed people. Right? Uh, and so that idea of we are linked through our oppression, we are linked because there are people who have power, we are not those people, right? We all have common interests um, on economic and, um, and racial fronts um, to have those conversations. And so. Um, in terms of what to learn from that, I think the thing is, the main thing is dialogue, right? Not being afraid to talk to people who are different from us and trying to find the commonality, right? If you can enter a conversation and say, okay, we come from here, you come from here, 
let's talk until we figure out what is the thing that we have in common. Maybe it's only one thing in the beginning, but you're gonna find out it's only one thing, right? Um, and then you start to build those relationships, I think. Wow, that's a, just a flood of beautiful things. I, I appreciate it, what we've been saying and I. Um, I wanted to think about that, the, just the, the, the highlighting of commonality that, that um, I noticed in Vermont, growing up here, coming here as a refugee when I was four, um, there is a special, there is a special <coughs> level of whiteness that, that is, um, that is fundamentally structured around you're guilty until proven wealthy, and that is one that that threatens everyone, and um, I, I would like to hear more about how our commonality and, and recognizing that, that we all have this oppression in our history, the more recent, the more obvious is, is represented by both of you in, 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 in part of in, in current history, but then it gives back to the Irish, to the, to, to the training ground for colonialism. And uh, so how it, to speak more to that whiteness as, as something that is not just about skin, but, but about how we, how we can, can see that there, that there is no hierarchy of oppression. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many um, economic components to kind of every facet, <laughs> right, of our culture and, and country. And so, um, you know, like, there's racism and then there's economic injustice. Those things are linked, but they're different. And so talking about economic injustice is a particularly powerful, like, when people really understand how the economic structures of our society work, right? Um, we understand how important it is to do things like vote, right? And how important it is to to band together, right? And, and, and use collective action because it takes a lot of voices to combat a single voice that has a lot of money and power, right? Um, and so that's, um, you know, I think a lesson that we can all learn is that, you know, we, we often feel powerless because we can't, you know, if we can't buy our way out of a problem, right? <laughs> but we can actually use collective action to, um, create change too. <laughs> All right. I wish I had a longer question. <laughs> I was trying to think just what's a really short to the point question that I could ask and instead I'm stalling. I'm stalling. <laughs> All right. Okay, here's my question. Right now, in this moment and in this work, what, where do you find both hope and joy? Oh, I think it's the cricket in the sweater. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, while we think about hope and joy, I think one of the things that um, is so exciting about doing work with humanities and trying to get communities and, and individuals to think about how important humanities is, is that humanities to me is always what allows us to pause, especially when things are very difficult, right? And we can use humanities then to kind of dissect things and figure out for ourselves how we want to move forward. But the more exciting part about humanities, and I, I don't think that everybody understands this, but you, I don't know that you find this so much in STEM engineering, you know, is humor. And I think that, you know, we forget that part of um, humanity is being able to laugh and being able to use that as a tool to um, have camaraderie with somebody, you know, come together with people. Um, and I just, you know, I think we forget sometimes the real uh, foundations of humanities that allow us to then think about things with hope and think that we're going to be okay we're gonna get through it. I say this a lot. We're gonna be okay. We're gonna get through it. 
we're going to be challenged, but we're going to use the skills that we have as individuals, but um, as individuals who are so tied to humanities to get through it. And whether we do that together, hopefully a lot more together, or if we really do that kind of thinking ourselves and moving ourselves forward. Um, you know, it seems like in this book, this is what we have seen, right? This is what you're talking about. How do these communities come together and really move things forward? Um, and I bet they laughed a lot. You're talking about your Apparently, I'm going to be Am I caught? Oh. My answer to that is actually going to be really short. The kids. <laughs> I mean, that's where I get my, my, my inspiration, my joy, my hope. I mean, like I just met yesterday at Montpelier, uh, at Main Street and at uh, Montpelier High School. And, like, they were, you know, they come in and they're like squirrely and they're like, you know, what's this going to be? <laughs> And then they're like, wait, what? Like, civil rights? Like, what? Like, what happened? Like, the Panthers did what? You know? So, like, they get really engaged by it. They get really outraged by it. And they get really... Like, you can see... <laughs> it's always only a few of them um, that end up being the ones who feel like they're not paying attention. For the most part, they're just, like, hooked on the idea that young people did this. We could do something. We want to be agents of change. Like that, I get them. Like they flock up at the end to be like, wait. So, you know, what can I do? Like you saw them like coming up at the end, you know, to to say, <coughs> you know, oh, we really like the book. We were really inspired by the book. I had lunch with the BIPOC group at the high school, and you know, you know, I sat, you know, I sat in there at first, and they're all shy, and they're like looking around, like, you know. Like, oh, like, are we gonna talk to the author? Are we gonna talk to the author? And then, like, you know, three minutes later, they're like, okay, so, like, on page 75, like, you talk about this. And, like, I read this whole thing, and I'm like, you read this whole thing? This is a 400 page book, you know, but that they're reading it. And they're, like, really passionate. And I don't know, it just, it gives me hope that, like, they're paying attention, that they are gonna reach across, like, racial lines, and that they're gonna find their own voices, and they're gonna figure out like how to transform the world, like they really are, right? And they did well. Uh, yeah. No, thank you both for that. I think that's a great place to end it. And I just want to say thank you again, Kaipa, for all your work. Thank you, Chairman.